Greetings. Today we begin our fall sermon series, which will be on the topic of Elijah. Elijah was one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. He appeared during the reign of Ahab. And today we will begin this series with a reading from 1 Kings chapter 16, which describes Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What is something in your life that you love so much that you can hardly imagine your life without it? Let me ask that question again. What do you enjoy in your life? What do you love so much that it's hard to imagine your life without it? I'll give you an example from my own life, from my time in college. And it may seem a bit trivial at first, but bear with me. When I was in college, I loved to go to the college hockey games. Now, I hadn't grown up as a hockey fan. I never played competitive hockey, nor did I really follow professional hockey. But in college, I loved to go to the hockey games. It was a small stadium and the stands were almost always full and there was a student section and with a group of friends I would go to the games. Our team was quite good and so we would root them on and we would cheer as they would score and win and then we would leave the games and enjoy uh, going out for pizza afterward. Like many in uh, the sports world, I got caught up and just started to love doing this. And it it wasn't just that I enjoyed the sport and I enjoyed watching the game. It was also that I enjoyed the camaraderie and the friendship. And I think I also enjoyed a, a taste of glory. Because whenever my team would go out on the ice and we would root for them and then they would score and they would win, We would cheer and we would participate in the glory of their victory. Now, one year, uh, our team made it to the national championship game. And uh, the game was uh, about a 12-hour drive away. And we had classes the previous uh, day. But a group of friends and I bought tickets and we drove through the night so that we could make it to the national championship game. And we did win, and I'm still enjoying that victory today, 4-0. But at the end of that game, when the last buzzer sounded, and the confetti started to drop onto the ice, we finally had that, that great moment that we had longed for and desired for all those years. The national championship within our grasp. And as the hardcore fans, we stayed at the stadium as the other fans left and the other team left, and we watched as the team uh, accepted the trophy. But then, in that moment, while we had finally achieved the great goal, I could begin to feel the glory slipping away. 
You know, it wasn't just a few minutes later that some custodial staff came out with big brooms onto the ice and they began to sweep up all of the confetti. And I realized that this glory, uh, which I had so enjoyed being a part of, and which I so longed for, I could not hold it within my grasp. The glory was slipping away. Now the reason the glory of that victory was slipping away is that it was a human thing. It was a human victory. Uh, one, one year, and uh, just to be repeated again the next by another team with another fans who would enjoy that moment and then see it slipping away too. And don't we all experience that in our lives of feeling the glory slip away? That's what happens whenever we love something more than we love God. That's what happens whenever we have idols in our lives. Today we are beginning a series on the story of Elijah. And I'd like to explore this feature of idols and idolatry in the sermon today. And I've got three points that will help us to explore. The first is Ahab. Uh, the second is idols, and the third is Elijah. Ahab, idols, and Elijah. So first, Ahab. Well, in our reading from 1 Kings 16, we read of Ahab, the king of Israel. Now, the text is very quick to point out that Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord, but then it goes on to explain how. Ahab married a woman named Jezebel, and Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbal, the king of the Sidonians, which was a region to the north. But moreover, Ahab married Jezebel and then took her form of worship, her religion, and established it in the kingdom of Israel. He went and served Baal and worshipped him, the text says. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. So Ahab took this false form of worship, this idolatry, and established it within his kingdom and in his capital city. Uh, Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, uh, says that we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And what he's talking about there is that we shouldn't, as Christians, marry those who are not Christians. Because then we are inviting another worship, a false worship, into our own families and households. And, of course, we may not think that a, a kind of mixed marriage today is at all equivalent to Ahab and Jezebel, but Paul seems to have that in mind. He says, what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we, he says, are the temple of the living God. In other words, we are made, our bodies are made for the worship of God, not for anything else. Now, I hope the story that I shared with you at the beginning of this sermon shows that false worship doesn't always look like uh, the worship of a, a physical idol. It's, it's not often so dramatic as we might read in the story of Ahab and Jezebel, and yet false worship happens all the time. It happens in each of our hearts. And that leads us to the second point, which is idols. Ahab and idols. And what I want to do is uh, direct you to this work of art that was made by Jared Bogus uh, for this series on Elijah. And what we see in this work of art is Jezebel holding up this statue, this figure of Baal, uh, and Ahab is kneeling there to the side, uh, worshiping and serving. And I think it'll be helpful for us to understand 
what the point was with this figure, this deity of Baal. So Baal was one of the gods of the ancient Canaanite religion. And like Greek and Roman religion, the Canaanites had multiple gods. It was polytheistic in a kind of pantheon. And there was a father god named El and uh, other gods, including his son, Baal. Now, both El and Baal were associated with the bull. That was the animal that represented them. Uh, and Baal specifically was associated with power over the skies. He was often called the one who rides on the clouds, and he was considered the god responsible for sending rain. So when Jezebel is lifting up this, this statue, this figure of Baal, and Ahab is worshiping, it's not that they're worshiping simply a dead statue. That's not what they're loving. What they are loving is rain. They are loving the power of the skies. And that makes a lot of sense for their context because it was rain that brought them food. It's kind of like the Egyptians uh, and their worship. They worshiped the god of the river, of the Nile. Why? Because it was the Nile River which brought them food. And so actually it makes a lot of sense that Ahab and Jezebel should be worshiping this figure of Baal, the one that they associated with rain. And yet, God insisted that they were worshiping something that was less than him. That this God of Baal was not the true God. That rain alone is not good enough to worship. And so God sent his prophet, Elijah. And that's our third point, Ahab, idols, and Elijah. He sent Elijah to go and speak to Ahab. And these are the first words of Elijah in the Bible. He says this, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. In other words, Elijah said, even though you worship Baal, this giver of rain, there will be no rain. God will take away the good thing that you are worshiping so that you might return and worship him. We have now been living for six going on seven months in the midst of this great pandemic and there has been great illness great economic impact a challenge to psychological health there have been changes in all of our lives and it is natural for us to ask the question well where is god in the pandemic why does he let this happen well, God's ways are not our ways. They are higher than ours. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so, though we, if we were running the world, probably wouldn't send a pandemic, God allows it. And one of the reasons that the Bible tells us that God allows these kinds of natural disasters is his desire and his attempt to bring us back to him. God will sometimes take away the things that we love so that we can love him first. Now, this is certainly not a politically correct concept, and it may seem harsh, but this is the way that God shows his love. Because we as humans are made to worship God. That's what gives us the deepest fulfillment. And if we worship rain, if we worship our jobs, 
if we worship our relationships or even other people, sometimes God will take those things away so that we can turn back to him. Whenever there is deprivation and suffering in our lives, we ought to consider how is it that we might repent so that we can receive God again. Elijah came to Ahab and Jezebel to tell them, you worship rain, but now the rain will not come. And he hoped that Ahab and Jezebel and all the people would turn back to the true and living God. May we too, in the midst of this time of trial and difficulty, may we consider how it is that God is working for good for those of us who love him. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, experiencing the same suffering and pain that we experience, doing it so that we might receive his life, that we might return back to God through him. I pray that as we reflect upon these words and as we continue in this series on Elijah over the coming weeks, that we would see how it is that we might turn back to the Lord, and how we might be like Elijah himself, listening to the word and following it, even in the midst of a hostile world. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.